Hi everyone, welcome back to the Power of a Hobby. I'm your host, Don Fenton, and I'm with a brand new guest. Hi Dave, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Dom. You? Yeah, very good. I'm really excited to have you on. We're obviously chatting off air a little bit, probably actually for the last probably 25 minutes, just about what obviously things that are going on. So Dave, for people who don't know who you are, why don't you introduce yourself and tell people about what you do? Yes, certainly. Well, I'm Dave. I'm based in Knutsford in Cheshire, and I'm a hypnotherapist, a resilience coach and trainer, and a keynote speaker. How long have you been doing all of that for? The hypnotherapy side I've been doing for just over three and a half years, four years. I absolutely love it. But the mental health side for decades. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of them things that when you get into it, you don't really come out of it. No. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in the mix of it now. Can't get out. I don't even know where the exit is. <laughs> Someone's covering up the exit for exactly. you because they don't want you leaving, mate. That's what it is. So in terms of the podcast, obviously, first question that I ask all the guests that come on, what does the power of a hobby mean to you? Good question. I would say it's escapism. We're living in a world now that's extremely tough. Cost of living, you know, COVID lockdowns, all the, it's just a bombard, 24 7 news. And it's just, it can get really depressing. So the power of a hobby to me is just escaping all that, just losing yourself in something that you're passionate about, something that you love. And, you know, whilst you're doing the hobby, nothing can touch you. Nothing can touch you. It's like being on holiday. You know, you notice you go on holiday, you're completely relaxed. You've got absolute clarity. You're not, you know, living to a time or a clock. You're just doing your own thing. And that's the way I see a hobby. It's like being on holiday away from the rest of the world. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I've never heard it big, put to a, a holiday, but no, I completely understand. And yeah, I think escapism, I think it boils down to escape, escapism and then it becomes identity. Yeah. And it becomes actually when you're within that, it's, it becomes ingrained in what you do. Um, I would, yeah, I would say now, I think more about my hobby on a daily basis than do everyday life. Genuinely, there's not a day, you know, whether it's TikTok or, you know, the news or anything like that. I'm just constantly thinking about the next day, the next thing. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah, everyday life and D1, you know what I mean? The hobby, it's all about the hobby for me. Yeah. And that's why I'm really excited because obviously I've, I've we've had a, a brief chat before this about your hobby and everything else. So, Dave, what? why don't you let everyone into what your hobby is? Well, my hobby is Disability Rugby League. I'm very blessed to work alongside my boyhood rugby league club, Solve Red Devils. I work alongside the foundation, Charitable Foundation. I'm an assistant head coach now at the physical disability team and the learning disability team. And I also play for the physical disability team as well. And, you know, we've been so blessed over the years. I've played in front of 30,000 people at St. James's Park. To have over 20,000 Salford fans screaming at you, playing against Wigan, incredible. You know what I mean? And these are experiences that some of these, you know, lads and girls even, will never ever experience i didn't even believe they could experience you know to go out and walk onto st james's park with all these screaming fans and the good thing is when we played at half time at, um, at the salford whole kr match every single fan stayed in the stands rather than going to the concourse to get the beer they all stayed to support the physical disability team which is incredible so the stock is has never been so high when it comes to disability rugby and everybody's bought into it, you know. I was at the wheelchair game a couple of days back against Wellington Wolves, and that is absolutely brutal. A friend of mine plays for the team. He is also a coach for the physical disability team. And my wife has banned me from playing it because she thinks it's just too tough, it's too rough. And the coach is like, no, you are playing it. So I'm now in a battle between my wife and the coach. I'm like, what do we do, what do we do? Yeah. I think the coach is going to win, but don't let the wife see the podcast. Don't yeah. when this does go out, don't share it. Yeah, but, <laughs> share it, just don't let her see it. Not to the wife now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's beautiful though. It's to see people. 
it, it's crazy because there's a couple of times where they just fell um, and the wheelchair tipped and there was face palm in the floor. And all of a sudden you saw the wheelchair wiggling and they got back up again and carried on. Well, you know what? We, there's so many lessons that we can teach people, you know what I mean? About resilience, about tenacity, about, you know, bounce back ability. You know what I mean? It's just so many lessons. That's why I love it. Well, where to where start with all of that? So let's still, let's go to the beginning of of of, of that journey or, or even just your rugby journey. Hmm. Um, so was rugby something that you'd always wanted to to have a look at or have a go at? Have you always been in, interested in rugby? Obviously being 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 a, a northern lad. Yeah. You know, is it is it always something that's been on the radar for you? It has, yeah. It's, I grew up, my nan and granddad lived right next to the Willows, Salford's old ground. And from the age of eight, my granddad used to take me to watch and we'd stand in the shed and incredible experience. And at the end of the game, my granddad would go into the Willows Variety Centre and we'd all jump on the pitch and play rugby. And it was great. And growing up in fifth year, which is year 11 now, uh, we joined, uh, we merged with a school, St. Lawrence's, which was right next to the Willows, and they was a rugby feeder club uh, for Salford. So they had players like Adrian Morley, Chris Morley, Nathan McAvoy, all within my sort of year groups. Um, and so we used to play rugby, and we was a footballing school before that. And um, so me, it, I likened it to bed and broomsticks, you know, that scene where all the animals were chasing the referee, and it was like... <laughs> And I was only five foot nothing. I was only small, looking like a milk bar kid. And they'd be all there greasing up and getting the studs on and, you know, looking really tough. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get killed here. So I used to forget my kit. I used to forget my kit all the time. And my old PE teacher, who taught my dad, got really peed off about this. I said, right, Dave, get into the girls' changing room now. Get a blouse, skirt, slim soles. You're playing. And no word of a lie, the school would be shut down now. But I had to get this blouse on, like this pea blouse, skirt, and got into the coach and went to Littleton Road playing fields where Man United used to train. And um, Steve Blakely it was. He was a former Salford player. He was coaching us that day. He was training us that day. And uh, he knew my mum because my mum used to work with John Wilkinson, who was the chairman of Salford. So I got off the coach with this skirt, Flowers and he looked at me and he just shook his head for what the hell's going on. So I thought, I'll go on the wing. Nobody touches the wing. <laughs> I'll be old. I'm fast. I'll go. And I got the ball and I ran and I looked round and everybody stopped. And I thought, oh, I've got him here. I'm, I'm killing it. Went to the goals, dived over, did a little NFL dance, you know, celebrating. And I realized that I'd gone off one pitch diagonal onto the next pitch along. <laughs> and that's why they stopped. <laughs> but, they call it character building now, I think. You know, that walk of shame with my skirt flapping in the wind. Um, and Steve Blake was there, like, just shaking his head, thinking, this is embarrassing. I can't wait to tell you, man. Um, but that was the point I thought, yeah, I don't think I'll ever play rugby again. Um, but it's always something in the back of my mind, thinking, you know yeah. what? I had an opportunity. It was a fantastic school that could feed into Salford. You know, he had a ready-made sort of conveyor belt, if it was that good. So it was nice quite a few years later that I get the opportunity to represent Salford with the disability team, you know, pulling on the shirt. And, you know, the club has this one club, one team ethos. You know what I mean? So it doesn't matter whether it's disability team, women's team or men's team, it's just one team, one club. So when you're pulling on that shirt, you are representing that badge. So I can still say, and the good thing is as well, I'll get heritage number. They just decided now that they are giving heritage numbers to disability players. Okay. Um, so when I do retire, I will get a heritage number. So I will be forever ingrained in Salford's history, which is mind blowing. I was going to say that is quite mind blowing. Those are just that, and it actually, uh, and I think this is where people don't under, fully understand the power of something, and especially when it's it's being involved in something that's bigger than yourself and the whole system and everything else. So obviously you. Obviously, you did little bits of school. How? When did you start getting involved with the, or when did you make the decision to get involved with the physical disability side? 
It was just over what, about four years ago, I think it was now. I'd gone through some serious health challenges. I've I myself got a rare form of neuron disease. Um, I've also got severe spinal canal stenosis and also a paralyzed diaphragm. And at one point, I was on 36 tablets a day plus morphine, and I couldn't get off the settee, played jigsaw with my sons or anything like that. And I was literally dying. Um, and long story short, I, I did a lot of internal work, educated myself about what drugs I was on and what I mean. eventually came off all my tablets. And once I started getting that bit of clarity, a bit of hope, out of nowhere, on Twitter it was, I saw um, an advert for the physical disability team from the foundation. And it was at Warrington at Victoria Park. So I thought, I said to my son, I said, should we go? So we went, not really understanding exactly what I was supposed to be doing. I just thought I was going to be watching. Anyway, Heather, who's now become one of my annoying friends, who's going to get me divorced. <laughs> and she said, oh, I said, get a kit on, you know, go and play. I'm like, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing here, you know, new rules, rugby, you know. So I said, just enjoy it. And that was the first word, she said, just enjoy it. And I got on, I was hooked. Never looked back. And as I say, I rose now to the assistant head coach and level two qualified as a rugby league coach. So I can go all over the world and coach. Fantastic. And now I, I coach the physical disability team. Just from that one chance meeting there, saying, go and enjoy it. Yeah. And, and this is where I think it's just that one decision to go and just to go there because there are so many people that want to do things mm. but don't have the courage to go. I, you know, I work with a lot of children. I work with a lot of adults. And actually, I've had comments from off, off the, the podcast going, you know, actually, I'm nervous about going. And actually, all it takes is that first step. All it takes is that moment to suddenly go, you know what, I'm just going to go there and see what happens. If you're at the point where you're thinking, I really would love to make the decision to go to this, then you need to make that decision and go. Because something's eating at you, you know what I mean? And it will always scratch away, itch away until you sort of scratch that itch. And especially, you know, within disability rugby or disability sports itself, you know, it's just a welcoming environment you know everybody's equal there's no oh you've only got one arm you your special needs or this it's everybody's it's all about enjoyment but any hobby you know i mean any sort of um hobby that you want to do just go and do it because it'll be there's no bad decision in life you know what i mean if you go and you're not enjoying it that's just not for you but there will be a hobby for you mm -hmm. so just make the decision because if somebody's actually taking the time out to volunteer to lead a hobby or a project, then they've got a good heart. And so therefore, they will be good people. You know what I mean? So just embrace that. When did you decide, obviously, you, start, so you started playing, got hooked. When did you start, actually, I want to go down the coaching route as well? About a year and a half ago, I just saw the joy on people's faces you know especially the physical disability is a little bit more competitive although the ethos is are still around enjoyment but it's still a little bit more competitive there's a lead yeah. form and you know the learning disability is where you know it really comes alive you know you've got people with severe autism you've got people with down syndrome you've got all different spectrums of disabilities and just seeing the faces light up when they score a try, or they, you know, make good pass and they're getting the crowd cheering, you know, it's making these these people, these kids, genuinely believe they're part of something. You know, they're not an afterthought. They're not an annoyance or a hindrance. They are the spectacle. They are the people that everybody's coming to see. You know what I mean? And it, that gives them such hope and such sort of courage to take further decisions about where they want to be. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was the point where I was at a Learn Disability Festival in, it was actually St. James's Park, just watching, the because we did a festival on the pitch as well. So I was involved in the physical disability play, and then I was facilitating the Learn, and just seeing, you know, the people cheering on sidelines, and, you know, you got Jack and Ben, and all these lads, like, just beaming smile. 
you know what I mean? I thought, that's worth more, you know what I mean, than anything. And I thought, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of this whole shebang, you know what yeah. I mean? And just give them these opportunities, you know what I mean? And without volunteers, without coaches, they're not going to get that opportunity, you know what I mean? So I dived in and did the qualifications and not looking back now. So when you decided four years ago to start, did you imagine that you would have gained the amount, the, the, the opportunities and the experiences that you've had over the last four years? Did you realise the impact it would have on your life? Did you realise it would have the impact just on what you've been involved with and the impact on everyone else just by making that step? No, I don't think you can truly appreciate. It's given me more than I've given from a sort of an emotional point. It's given me so much more, but I never envisaged, you know, in July, in August, sorry, we were at Ellen Road for Magic Weekend. You know, nobody wants, it's the wrong side of the Pennines for me that, you know, we're going there, there's going to be 30, 40,000 people, you know what I mean? We've been to Hall, we've been to Wigan, we've played at some of the biggest stadiums around in the north. Yeah, it, it, it's given me so much more, and I never envisaged how much joy it would give. As I say, I, I think about it more than I do everyday life. You know what I mean? I'm constantly thinking about the next thing, how we can make it even better, how I can make it even bigger for them. Um, and it's taken, it genuinely has taken over my life, you know People always say the PR me, but I'm never out of Salford gear. You know, like, <laughs> nice little promotion on, on the camera today as well. Yeah, get yourself down <laughs> to the Salford Stadium. And, but no, it's I'm never out. Of, you know, my wardrobe is just full of Salford kits mm. and hoodies and various sort other of things. It's just, I think it's that it just feels family. It, that's probably the best word that I can give. And this is across the board. You know, I know the guys at Wigan. I know the guys in Wakefield. It's family. You know what I mean? And whenever we go, we're meeting up with all these different people and what have you. And we've created this massive community. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's given me so much. I'm forever thankful. I'm, I, there's not a day that I don't think I'm, I'm genuinely grateful for the opportunity that I've been presented with. But it was all through that one decision to go to Warrington four years ago. Yeah. And it's, I just think, and this is the thing, I think these are the moments. And Yes. Obviously, what we find on, on the podcast is the fact that when we are, um, when people are talking about their hobbies, suddenly it sometimes dawns on them what's happened. Yeah. And individual moments where actually there's a reason it didn't work when you were younger. But actually then being able to have that, making that moment to make that decision go. Because for me now, you know, I've still got an awful lot of work to do to provide as many people as we can the opportunity to try different hobbies. That's, you know, and, you know, you say from a, I'm very grateful for what I've been involved with through through sport and disability sport and through the opportunities we get to try I've, had to travel around the world through through rugby and stuff like that that I never ever thought I'd have. But actually, again, they are moments and decisions because I I'm, you know, I started as a young child. Mm. And I've had all these moments come through. There are so many people who, whether they think they should have a hobby or not who actually, personally, I believe, are missing out yeah. because they're not part of something. If you, if there were two moments that have stood out for you over the last four years, so what would they two moments be? The one that sticks out more than anything is uh, the Magic Weekend at Newcastle, St. James Park. My, I'm so blessed the fact that I get to play with my sons alongside my sons, which... You know what I mean? So, was, you know, I'm never losing my sons to the friends and whatever because I've always got this to, to come back yeah. on. But my eldest, who's 17, who's autistic, he was becoming really overwhelmed with it. He was sat on the sidelines, had been sort of subbed off, 
sat on the sideline and he just sort of broke down. It was like, it was just so much, you know. It, and it was a sort of a happy breakdown. It wasn't yeah. a yeah. negative breakdown. And at the end of the game, Ben Sewell uh, from Wigan, he came over to my son Ben and he gave him the biggest hug. I said, you'll remember this day for the rest of your life in a positive way. So just look around, take it in, just look around. And I was stood there, you know, and thinking, parents' job is this, you know what I mean? And I did give him the spoil I needed. And I'm, I'm filling up now thinking about it, but the fact that another team mate came over, recognised that he was having a moment and gave him a big hug. Mind-blowing. You know what I mean? I, genuinely, I'm filling up thinking about it. And he will remember that for the rest of his life, but in a positive way. You know what I mean? Because... How many people get the opportunity to play in front of 30, 40,000 people and hear your name being sung? No, it doesn't happen. And the second one would be probably when I got the coaching qualification. You know, it was over a period of a few months. I only went to Lee. I didn't travel far. I went to Lee. But it was when I did the, got the appraisal and got the sign off saying, yeah. I was the only one in that cohort who got the highest one you could get was competent C. I was the only one who got the full C. And I generally put it down to the fact that I work on a weekly basis with disability. Yeah. Because I'm thinking so much deeper and so much more out of the box. Um, and I think that's what put me in good stead. Because everybody else in that cohort was just working with under 11s, under 7s, not, you know, the yeah. um, primary school and well, it's, it was secondary school. But because I'm working on a consistent basis within disability, I'm constantly thinking out of the box and constantly yeah. thinking deeper. And I genuinely believe that's what gave me the best opportunity to fully pass. And that was a moment I was extremely proud of because not the point that made it, it was the fact that what are the possibilities now? Yeah. I mean, how many lives can be changed now by using my passion, by using my drive? How many lives can be changed for the better? You know, so they're the two moments that stick out. And as I say, we could see the emotion there. That is the power of a hobby. For me, that that says it all because actually, I think, it, and I really from a, a mental health point of view there's nothing you know you, you have that chance to switch off from everything else you have that and you, you are in that moment and actually generally nothing else can touch you while you're in that moment because that's you know obviously playing a physical game as we, we we have done if you switch off in that moment you're going to get you're going to get you're going to get a tackle and you're, and you're going to not be concentrating and you're going to go oh my you know and it's going to hurt but actually, you have that moment to release all the stress. You have that moment to relieve all the anxiety and leave it on the park. Yeah. But as you said now, for me, sport is a family. Rugby more than anything. You know, my, my daughters now play girls football. Yeah, it's great. And I love what they're doing. But it's still not the same as what I've had in rugby. Hmm. Because actually, you know, I having played for many years, half probably ninety percent of my friends are people I grew up playing rugby with, and we still chat now, and we we're there for each other, and and we don't have to talk all the time, but we know that if one if someone's in need, then we'll go there and we'll be yeah. there for them because that's what you do, and you put your body on the line for each other for years after years, and you build that up. For someone who's listened to this, last question now, so you can, and we'll let you get on. Uh, for someone who's listening, let's say this in, in in disability sports. Some young person's got a disability or an adult's got a disability and it's like, oh, I really want to do something, but I don't know where to start. What would you say to them? First thing, I would go onto the internet and I would go on to that particular club's website because there will always be a contact there that you can get in touch with. A lot of, you know... A lot of big clubs now, you know, not just your local community clubs, but the big clubs in Super League, in Premier League, have disability 
yeah. uh, sports attached to it. Um, so they will have a dedicated disability person um, on their website. And I would just drop them an email or make them a phone call. And I would ask the question, um, and I urge parents to ask the question, what's the best thing that could happen? Not what's the worst thing? You know, yeah. yes, you can get some sort of anxiety thinking about the first time yeah. you got over. But just ask the question, what's the best thing that could happen here? Because I guarantee it will happen. There is no, I can't see a downside to be involved in disability sports. Yeah. There's no judgment. There's no competitiveness. There's no nastiness. It's just everybody's out for each other, supporting each other and giving them the best possible life they can get. Yeah, love that. Mate, make that call, make that email. Yeah. And then just take it with both, take it with what you can, make that first step. And and actually, as you say, I don't think you'll ever look back and regret that decision. No. As you say, it might be you try one and it's not for you. Okay, we'll try another one. Try a different activity, try something else. But obviously from our point, yeah, make that first step and give it a go. Life can be tough. Make it a little yeah. bit easier on yourself. Get yourself a hobby. Yeah, love that. D Dave, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about what you're doing, where can they find you? I play out a lot on LinkedIn, so you can uh, look me up there, Dave Heffernan Speaker. Twitter, DA Heffernan. They're the two. Uh, I'm you can get me on Facebook under David Heffernan. But yeah, Twitter and LinkedIn is where I play out. Brilliant. And then, and what we'll do, we'll also put some links out when we put the video out as well and put the podcast out as well. Dave, thank you so much for your time yeah. doing what you're doing. And we will definitely have to catch up soon. And I'll no have worries. to come and I'll have to see if I can come and watch some games. Get yourself to a game. Yeah. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, wicked. Dave, thanks so much for your time. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm Don Fenton, your host. This is the Power of a Hobby, and we'll see you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye.